You want to give the Lord a hand? Give Him a big hand. He's worthy. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Lord and King of Malaysia. And we praise God for what He's doing. And uh, it's a joy just to be back in Dew MC and just to be associated with your very young, evergreen pastor, Pastor Daniel Ho. It's amazing, you know. Uh, somebody commented last night that I've got a little bit more hair since my last visit, and he has lost a little bit more hair. Uh, and so it's obvious that the anointing has grown great, greater on his life, you know. Uh, but it's great to be back here. Now, I just want to say a little bit more about the Sky Community Kota Marudu Hostel project that we've been running for now. This is our fourth year. And, you know, uh, you, know you, saw the, uh, you saw the orchestra there. That's a strings orchestra of about 42 students. Uh, they've been playing the violin, the violas, and the cellos. And that orchestra, uh, you know, th when they played and performed, that was as a result of just two practices a month for six months. A total of 12 practices from zero to where they are today, right now. And that's an incredible, incredible performance. You know, it's not like the London Philharmonic Orchestra, but you know, I can tell you, it gives them huge confidence when they stand in front of the crowds and they stand with their violins, and some of them have never even touched a violin or seen a cello before. And there they are, some of these ladies, uh, these girls in the hostels, they are really a little bit ashamed or shy or actually splaying their legs to put a cello. So we have to make sure they wear a pair of jeans and, and teach them that this is okay. And, and when they come together, they make really wonderful music. Where did it come from? They come from a background that is underprivileged, marginalized, often poverty-stricken. Now, many of you uh, people in the city, we know what opportunities are like. We've taken use of opportunities, but for them, they don't even know what opportunity looks like for many of them. And we believe sowing into the next generation in education is one of the ways of breaking the poverty cycle. But I'll tell you why the hostel project is so important. Well, it's simply because Malaysia has a Christian population of about 9 point, about 2% to 9.5%. Nearly 7% of that population is in East Malaysia. So the strength of the church in Malaysia for the future rests upon the strength of the East Malaysian church. Somebody say amen to that. It does. And you know, the leaders that are leading the church in Malaysia today are Chinese or Indians. They are the voices of the church in Malaysia. But I will tell you, much as we are thankful in the history of the Malaysian church for many Chinese and Indian leaders, Malaysians, who stand up and speak on behalf of the church, that's nothing like a Bumiputra, an original son of the soil, an original indigenous Malaysian, Standing up, a Bumiputra standing up and speaking on behalf of the church and standing to lead the church in our nation. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Now, how many of you would like to see that happen? Can I see your hands? Well, I'll tell you what, it's in the making because this is where we need, we need to sow into the next generation. There's a difference between the voice of a Malaysian Indian and Malaysian Chinese speaking on behalf of the church to the voice of an indigenous Bumiputra saying, this is Malaysian church. Malaysian church, we are rooted. The Christianity and the church is rooted in Malaysia. Why? Because it is the religion, it is the religion of the indigenous sons of the soil of this country. So Christianity has a root in this nation. It is native to this nation. It is. And that's why the voice will be different when they stand up and speak. And that's why when we sow into the hostel project, we're sowing into the next generation so they will rise up to lead us in the future generation. And somebody say an amen to that. Uh, and so that's, that's why, and now the power of this uh, hostel program is simply this. We take about 40 students because there's no way we can house a hostel, have a hostel to house 500 students. Around Kota Marudu area, there are two major secondary schools. And uh, there are about 1,500 students uh, uh, in each school, about 1,200 to 1,500 students uh, in each school. And about 500 students of these in each school are, are Bumiputras, Christians. And many of them are actually in Azramas, uh, wardens uh, in, in hostels in the school. And the, the Islamization pressure on many of them is very high. There is no way we can ha build hostels of that kind of size to house all of them. It is, it is impossible for a church or any church to do it. So this is what we do. We take a hostel, we house about 40 students. We build them up in a spirit of excellence. We make sure that academically, spiritually, in leadership, as well in confidence and the speaking of English, they grow. And as they grow in the school, they begin to influence the school, influence their peers in the school. They begin to lead the school. From the tail, they become the head. From underneath, they become above. And they begin to lead the school and influence the school. So the leverage factor is 40 to 500. It is a 1 to 10 leverage factor. 
So when you talk just pure investment, it is eminently worthwhile having a tenfold return, a 1,000% return on your investments. Can somebody say an amen to that? It's really worthwhile. And what they do in the school is they go in and they, because they lead academically, they lead spiritually, they can strengthen the students in the school and in our dramas. That's wonderful. So as to prevent the tide of moving to another religion and strengthen them spiritually as well. And at the same time, academically, they have increasing influence. And because they speak English better, and confidence grows in their lives. And what has happened is that often on Saturday mornings, when these students are released out, these students from the ashramas are released out from their school, our students who are t- uh, from our hostel, who attend the same school in the daytime, uh, and come back to stay in the hostel at night, our students on a Saturday morning run Alpha Balea which is a Bahasa Malaysia version of Alpha Youth. And so uh, for about a couple of hours during the, during the morning, Saturday morning or afternoon sessions when the students are let out of the hostel to do shopping in the, in the surrounding uh, shops and, and towns. So what we do is we run an Alpha Balea and we have hundreds of these students coming in. And our students, they're trained to do Alpha, to do Alpha and to teach in Alpha, to facilitate in Alpha, to cook so that they have food to eat in the Alpha and to run the Alpha courses and thereby just leveraging back and building up the spiritual uh, influence in the, in the schools so that these, these uh, asrama, bumiputras now become strengthened in their faith. It's a 1 to 10 ratio, 1 to 10 multiplication at least, maybe even 1 to 15 and 1 to 18. So that's how we believe uh, that template can be done. It can be done in any church that's com- by any church that's committed. And I believe DUMC has a big part to play in the church in East Malaysia. And all God's people said, Amen. you have a big part. You have been instrumental in doing so many things. And we thank God for a wonderful pastor like yours who has a heart for East Malaysia. Now, my challenge to you here is, the hostel works well because it has got a warden that's godly, a warden who has some level of academic training and excellence who then influence the children and the kids so that when they move from Form 1 to Form 5 and so on, they begin to grow as leaders. I want to challenge you, GMC, that if you are a couple, and you may be just a, even a young couple, may not be a retired couple, you can be a retired couple, but if you're, if you're a young couple, even a young couple, I would challenge you to consider that if DUMC comes in to do a project like that, and they are look, your senior pastor is looking at it in a certain part of Sabah to replicate the same template we have been using, because it really produces results, that you give considerable thought to giving possibly two or three years to actually coming in and being a warden. Uh, why is it worthwhile being that? Firstly, I would tell you three reasons why if you're a young couple, it's, and you know, even if you have kids, it's worthwhile. Firstly, we hold the hostel in a place where there is not too far in the interior. It is near a secondary school of great significance and great influence, and most of these are in secondary towns, so very close to secondary towns. Our criteria for where a hostel ought to be is that there must be at least one Kentucky Fried Chicken in that place. So your children won't be deprived and it's got a good kind of district hospital nearby, so your children will be deprived. But all the interior children come to that secondary school. So it's a place of influence. Number two, because if you go and do that, what will happen is that you are sowing your life not into a flash in the pan thing. It is strategic. It will yield results from your life. I'm not sure how much results you yield rather than gaining an increased bottom line for your company right now. But here is eternal sowing for the next two, three years into a generation that can influence our nation. It's strategically well worth it. You give three years of your life to sow into this. And because it's not something that's temporal. And as you sow into this, you see these lives change. And the third reason is, at the same time, you'll be paid for what you do it. I don't know what your pastor's going to pay you, but I don't think it's going to be a bad pay, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be quite good. It's going to be quite good pay. And I'll tell you why. Because DUMC is a generous church. And all God's people said, yeah. turn to your neighbor and say, be a generous church. Because you're great givers. And so if you sow and you go there, uh, you will receive your salary. But I will tell you one thing. Every bit of a salary will be saved. Why? Because there's nothing to spend on there. <laughs> Utilities are paid for. Food is paid for. Everything is paid for. You, you, you serve there for three years, you collect three years' worth of salary now you've not spent. You come back to KL, you dump it as a deposit for your next house. <laughs> come on. It's really got to be worth it. It's really got to be worth it. 
You are not behind the curve. You are in front of the curve. You're in front of your, your, your peers. You have not lost out. And you, when you serve God, you will never lose out. Somebody say an amen. And I give you one fourth reason just to, so that you can seal it in your hearts. When you go back into the corporate world and you get back in and you spend two years doing this, and they say, what have you been doing for the last two years? I have been serving in the interior, leading 50 students, 40 students, and I've been sowing to them this hostel project and sowing into the poor and all that, and I've been giving that life so that they can change. I'll show you some pictures of what's happened and this is what they do. At your interview for your next job, it won't be a minus for you, it will be a double plus. Because if I'm a corporate man, I'm a CEO, I'm looking for guys who can come into my corporation, I'm looking for these kind of guys. They're innovative, they're bold, They've gone and skipped their life and they've given their lives into the community and the sacrifice. I want these kind of guys in my. I don't want the kind of guys who just graduated from college, you know, a double distinction, but you're not quite sure what they, they feel like, what's their values. I want somebody of these values. So I will tell you, if you're young, you're just married, or you just got a, a kid, you're not going into the wild, wild east, the Ulu, or back and beyond. You're going into a place where there's a Kentucky fry. <laughs> and you're going to a place where you can save a lot of money. You go into a place that you will, when you do work, that will look good on your CV when you go back into the corporate world. And above all, you are making the two, three best years of your life because you're sowing into something that the eternal and lasting values for eternity and generational values for the next generation and national and historical values in the impact for our nation. So it's really worth it. Can somebody say amen? amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I heard you say amen. And turn to your neighbor again and say, you know, you should think about this. <laughs> so I pray that you will consider, and when this is up, you, many of you young people, you consider God's call upon your life. God is speaking to somebody right now, it could be a call on your life. That next two years, the next three years. So I want to encourage you, because this church has a deep, deep calling to impact this nation. And not only just in the present, but for the future of this nation. That's why God has brought you here to DUMC. Don't underestimate my church. Yeah. And my church is not just you, my church. It is God saying to you, don't underestimate my church. God says that. Can somebody say an amen? amen. Turn to your neighbor one more time and say, God is definitely speaking to you this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> now this morning, I'd, I'd like to share with you, I come and uh, bring you a word of God that really talk about you know, how God wants us to break through. Somebody say breakthrough in terms of our discipleship in walking with Jesus, you know? Now, Nancy and I, we've been married for 31 years now. How many of you have been married for 31 years or more? Can I see your hands? Wow, I know I have to do deference to all of you because it's not easy keeping a marriage going for 31 years, but Nancy and I have been married for 31 years. Uh, we were married in the UK, in England, and uh, we, our marriage didn't start well. Everything that could go wrong on our wedding day went wrong. Murphy's Law applied on our wedding day, you know? On the wedding morning, on the, day, on the wedding morning, there I was, all spruced up, dressed up, you know? And there was, I, I, I sat in the front seat of my old Ford Escort car that was going to take me to the church. Within the next half hour, the wedding was going to start. And I had as my best man, my driver. He was also all spruced up. Uh, a medical student, I just graduated as a doctor. He was a medical student and uh, he, was, he was my best man. Today, he's a professor of nephrology, actually in Sheffield University today, you know, but then we were poverty-stricken medical students or just graduated. I was going to get married, and he was my, my best man, and uh, my old Ford Escort, and uh, he slipped the key into the ignition, turned the ignition, and he went click, 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 click. My battery was flat. I never look after my car one, you know, not even for my wedding day. So my battery was flat, and I, I sat there, he looked at me in abject horror, and I, I, I just looked stunned. I wasn't going to get to my church on time. And he ran out of the car and he went into the boarding house where we had spent the night and knocked on every door he could find on a Saturday morning, that is. You know, Saturday morning, everybody sleeps at 12 o'clock. And this was about 9.30 in the morning. He was banging on every door and people were coming out, you know, rubbing their eyes, looking bemused, you know, in their nightgowns and everything else. And he shouted to all of them, my friend's got to get married. You've got to get him, get him quick. Can you push the car? It was one of those manual cars you could push. So, you know, while, meanwhile, while he had run in, I was sitting there silently because the car wouldn't start. And I said to God, God, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> and so anyway, they got into the car, they got the car and they pushed it, and I was push-started, and I got to the church on time. 
People often ask me, you know, uh, how did you marry your wife? I said I had no choice. I was literally pushed into her arms that day. <laughs> but you know, another thing happened just about a week before the wedding. Uh, I lost my contact lenses. Now, in those days, they were semi-permeable gas lenses. And uh, you need to grind those glass and all that. And, and you get a replacement in three weeks. Those were the days, not like today. And so I write my optician that says, no way we can get the glasses for you. In, in, so you just have to just, you know, get married without your contacts. And Nancy, my beautiful bride, she wears glasses. But on that day, like all beautiful brides, she decided to dispense with the glasses. <laughs> so on that morning, it was the blind marrying the blind. So <laughs> it was a marriage by faith. It was literally by faith, okay? That's how we started on that day. You know, it was everything that what could go wrong went wrong. And, and nobody taught us, uh, we didn't have a rehearsal. It was one of these El Cheapo, you know, cheapskate weddings because we were poverty stricken. We didn't have any money. And uh, we didn't have time even to go for a rehearsal uh, for the wedding day. And so, so you know, uh, I just thought, you know, well, weddings are quite simple. You just do what you're told and the minister tells you. So, so it came to the point where the minister said to me, and now, Philip, you may kiss your bride. And I thought, what do I do now? Uh, so she had that veil over her. So I decided to kiss to get access. I have to lift the veil. So I lifted up the veil to get access to her and I dutifully kissed her. Then I didn't know what to do, so I pulled the veil down again. <laughs> I tell you, we, didn't, we were so poverty stricken, we didn't have a video. I, if had that been videoed, I, you know, I wouldn't have been able to lift that down for the rest of my life. And everybody laughed just like you in the church. They were chuckling, and the minister had to lean over, you know, with that look upon me, and he lifted up back the veil again. And then we went to the tea reception room just in the church, a small tea reception room, and we got everybody of our friends that we could find who could help us with the wedding to prepare sandwiches, you know, bring all these cakes and all that for free. And many of them were, took pity on us for free. But there was the wedding cake. And a couple of weeks before, my brother's girlfriend had volunteered to make us the wedding cake for free. And we said, of course, of course. But what she never told us is that she had never made a wedding cake before. And so it was the wedding cake. When it came to the cutting of the cake ceremony, both of us took the, uh, the, the knife, it was a bread knife in our hands, and we proceeded to cut the cake when they announced it. And as we tried to cut it, we found it wouldn't cut. <laughs> she had made the icing, you know, the thickness of concrete slabs. It wouldn't cut. So we started sawing through it. Saw, saw, saw. It still wouldn't cut. So we started tapping it just to make sure, try to cut it through. It still wouldn't cut. And eventually, we did the one thing only to make a cut. We both lifted up traditional samurai fashion and went, ah, chop. <laughs> and that's how we began our wedding. That's how we began our marriage. Not very auspicious. All and everything went wrong. It was, I think, the same year or the year before, after, I can't remember. It was the same year where Princess Diana got married. And I, the, the, one, the few months before uh, we got married, I had been to see her wedding uh, as the carriages came out of Buckingham Palace, I stood in front of Buckingham Palace with hundreds of thousands of people. I was there very early, saw the carriages come out, saw the carriages go back, I saw the, the wedding take place at St. Paul's on the mobile television there, and I saw them kissing on the balcony, and I thought, wow, what a fairy tale wedding. What a grand, you know, wonderful fairy tale, wonderful, rich, lavish, wonderful wedding. But you know where it all went. After 10 years, it all went wrong. And sadly, she's not with us today, right, tra tragically. Now, I just want to say this, you know, even though you may be poverty-stricken, it's not the way you start. It's the way you continue and the way you finish. Can somebody say an amen to that? So those of you who are getting married, you know, don't have all these lav necessary lavish things, get into debt. It's not the way you start. It's the way you continue and the way you finish. Somebody say an amen to that. But therefore, you know, but for me now, after 31 years, we're still very much in love. We're still great friends, but it could have been so different. We could have finished that wedding day blaming one another. She could have blamed me and said, you know, if only you hadn't done this, but suppose you hadn't done this, but suppose we didn't have a cheapskate wedding, but suppose we had just practiced, you know, for the uh, rehearse for the wedding, but suppose we had not gone, uh, you know, uh, El Cheapo and, and got some proper man to make the cake, but suppose, but suppose, we could have lived a life of but suppose, but suppose this, but suppose that, you know, regrets. But I want to tell you that whatever the devil tried to do or whatever was our mistakes, whatever our regrets at that wedding, we chose not to live in but suppose. We chose not to live in the world of but suppose. We chose to live in the world of but God. 
But God can do this. But God has done this. But God will see us through. But God. Somebody say, but God. Yeah. Say it aloud, but God. Yeah. Say it aloud, but God. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, but God. Yeah. But God. And this morning, I want to speak about, but God. And I want to ask you to, sh- to, to read these verses from the Bible. Because this is God's promise to you today. This is where God wants to bring you back this morning as you continue to walk with Him as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is from Ephesians chapter 2. And when we read the Scriptures together, I want you to read it strongly. I want you to read it loudly with conviction. Are you ready now? That's very weak. Are you ready now? Are you ready to read now? Okay, ready, go. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Somebody say, but God. You know, but what is the opposite of but God? It is this word, but suppose. But suppose this bad thing happens again. But suppose God didn't, doesn't show up when we obey Him. But suppose the worst comes. But suppose, but suppose is the language of fear. Born out of man's premises. But God is the language of faith. Born out of God's promises. Say it one more time. But suppose it's the language of fear born out of man's premises. But God is the language of faith born out of God's promises. There's a heaven and earth difference between what you say when you address the challenges and mountains in your life, between but suppose it does happen, but suppose God doesn't show up, but suppose the worst comes, but suppose, you know, I fail again. There's a world of difference between but suppose and facing the mountains and saying, I know this is the situation, the challenges are there, it's great, the mark obstacles are great, the crisis is great, but God. It's a big difference between the two. Because one is the language of faith, born out of God's promises. The other is the language of fear, born out of man's premises. And this was the language of Moses. When he first encountered God at a burning bush in Exodus, and God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt because I've seen the hundreds of years of slavery of my people and they're crying out to me. I want you to go back to them and lead them out to the land that I've promised to them. Now, you know, Moses at that point had spent 40 years in the backside of the Sinai Desert just looking after sheep. Now, he had been brought up in the courts of Pharaoh as an Egyptian prince. But you know what had happened? He tried to kill an Egyptian slave driver before. And as a result of that, Pharaoh was after him. He had killed an Egyptian slave driver. And Pharaoh had come after him. And he became a recluse, a fugitive, ran away because he feared for his life. Everything that he dreamed of as a deliverer for his people was shattered. All his dreams were broken. He never wanted to go back to Egypt again. He never wanted to go back to the courts of Pharaoh. He never wanted to assume that he could lead people again. He had been finished because he he had such a bad, bad experience. And now for 40 years in the backside of the Sinai Desert, he wanted to forget about everything, get Egypt out of his system. And God appears to him and says, I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to lead my people out of slavery into the land I'm going to give them. I want you to go back to Moses and address Pharaoh, the king of the mightiest empire in the Middle East at that time, and let my people go. And Moses' response when he met with God in the burning bush out in the backside of the Sinai Desert were these words. He said, and Moses answered, and said to God, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to me or to you. But but suppose they don't listen, but suppose the whole thing goes wrong again like in the past. And many of us, sometimes we are trapped in this life of our past from but suppose. Because it's like, I've had a marriage breakdown. I never dare in a relationship again. I've been abused by men in the past. I never dare have a relationship with a man again. You know, I tried to serve God and things, bad things happen to me. I never want to serve God. But suppose God doesn't show up again. But suppose this happens again. And we are trapped in that. And, you know, for some of us, it's that part of the journey. For Moses, for 40 years, he went from a man who had confidence to a man who had none. 
and he became what is known as a but man. Every time you, God tells him something, he said, but, but. Do you know? You know, you know, he just like, he had lots of buts in his mind. And you know, what's the difference between sheep and goats? Are we sheep or goats? We are sheep or goats? You know what's the difference between sheep and goats? Sheep always obey the master. So they go, master, master. Goats, they always have their butts. They go, but, 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 but. They're always butting away. Reminds me of a, a young English rural pastor who was preaching in a church in rural England and she was preaching on Exodus chapter 4, verse, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, but suppose. And he was using this verse to talk about the buts of our lives. The excuses we make before God for the things we don't do in our lives, the buts of our lives. And it was such a well-received sermon that he decided he was going to preach the same sermon when he went to America on his pastor's exchange program the following month. But what he didn't realize was the word but, spelled with a double T. A word not used in rural England, but used in the United States, it referred to the posterior aspect of the human anatomy, which is your backside, like your bum bum, you know what I mean? Huh? And uh, he didn't know that. So the next month, he went into this vast American congregation in this pastor's exchange program. On the first Sunday, he ascended to the pulpit and promptly announced his text, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, the topic of my sermon this morning is on the, I want to preach on three buts. <laughs> and everybody looked shocked, but he wasn't aware of it. So he proceeded. He said, point number one, I want to say this, everyone has a but. He said, point number two, it's easy to see other people's butts. <laughs> and now point number three, he said, but it's very difficult to see your own butt. <laughs> so turn to your neighbor and say, don't be a butt person. <laughs> For Moses, that's what he said, you know, but suppose. But suppose is the language of fear born out of God's immense premises. It will do three things in your life. If you have but suppose, but suppose, God tells you to do something, but suppose. God says to you, go to Sabah and become the warden. Oh, of the new hostel, the UMC hostel. Wow. And you, but, 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 but suppose. <laughs> you should say, but God, I know I'm going to Sabah, which is the best place in the world. You okay? I know I have my fears, but God. Can somebody say an amen? I know I think my, my, my peers will try to, you know, my, will bypass me, they think. No, I will bypass them. They won't bypass me, but God, because of but God. Can somebody say an amen? But if you have but suppose as your, your language all the time, God speaks to you this morning about the warden hostel, and you're saying but suppose, but suppose, you're in the same league with Moses, because but suppose will do three things. Firstly, it will paralyze you spiritually. Paralyzed you spiritually. Moses was paralyzed into inactivity for 40 years. He was a prince of Egypt, etc., etc. Now living in fear, in obscurity, in semi retirement, a recluse. He could lead thousands, but now he was just looking after sheep. He was locked in by his fear. You know, in medicine, we have a syndrome that's called the locked in syndrome. And the Loxin syndrome is actually a stroke that affects a certain part of your brain that virtually incapacitates every muscle that's in your body. You can't move a single muscle in your body. You're still alive, your heart is beating, you can still breathe, but you can't move any of the other muscles except your eye muscles. You can just look. That's about the only muscle you can move in your body. You are living, but you are dead because you're paralyzed. And it's a terrible, terrible syndrome to have because that fear grips you and locks you in. You know, one of the things that I enjoy uh, doing is going into the jungle in Borneo, where I am, in Sabah. There are lots of beautiful jungles and uh, beautiful nature trails, and I, I love going to them. But you know, when I go into nature trails, uh, it's not just you encounter wild animals here and there, but you, know, you seldom meet wild animals because you also scatter when they hear you coming. But one thing you will always meet, and they're after your blood. What is it? Leeches. Leeches. How many of you love leeches here? No, I, I know, I know, I, I'm talking about the jungle kind. I know there are lots of other leeches in the city, you know, that, that different type, but, but the ones I'm talking about are in the jungle, okay? Yeah, uh, and you know, leeches. I'm not afraid of leeches, but one day um, I was in the jungle, I was walking and jungle trekking, and I, I happened to stop by and just admire the scenery, you know, reflect on God's goodness to me. And, you know, I heard the, the breeze kind of blowing through the, 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 the leaves, uh, rustling the leaves, and then the breeze stopped. And when it stopped, I still heard rustling. That's funny. 
breeze is gone. I mean, it's like what rustling, rustle, rustle, rustle. Then I knew that it was coming from the ground. Then I thought, what's this rustling from the ground? I couldn't see. And then I saw I had walked into a leech nest. And there were thousands of leeches coming for me. When that happens, what do you do? You say, in Jesus' name, Hallelujah, like, Commander Leech. <laughs> I know do you ever see people are like that? I know, I know they are. But I'm not like that, you know. I see this leech coming from me. I'm not afraid of leeches. I'm not going to be food for them. You know, I ran. But sometimes I take other groups into the jungle for jungle walks. And especially girls who come from the city. Especially from KL. <laughs> never been to a jungle, never seen a leech before. And then instead of, and go to jungle, they want to wear shorts. <laughs> so that their beautiful white legs and all that are exposed. And they want to walk, you know. Some of them always want to come in high heel shoes in a jungle track. <laughs> Oh man, they tell, tell you, you cannot do that. So they come and they walk behind them. And then suddenly one of these groups, and suddenly I was walking with them and one of these girls suddenly screamed out, Eee! We said, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? We thought something. He says, there's something on my leg. Oh, he says, whoa, it's so terrible. What's the name on my leg? It's a black thing, you know. And we said, it's a leech. For goodness sake, it's only a leech. Leech! Ah! I'm going to die! I'm going to die! Leech! She says, we should just, it's a leech, we're going to say, just rub it off, get it off, you know. No, I can't, somebody help, I'm going to die. Now the question is, does she have the leech or does the leech have her? <laughs> you see, fear will paralyze us. Because every time God tells us, you stop up in faith, I'll be with you, but, 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 but God, but God, but, but, but suppose, but suppose, but suppose, but what if, but this. And that was the language of Moses. And God is speaking to all of us here today because you've had experiences that have trapped you. And every time now God calls you, come on, move with me. But suppose you don't show up. But suppose I make a fool of myself. But suppose it happens again. The second thing but suppose will do is it will cap your potential. It will cap your potential. Ralph Waldo Emerson said these words. He said, what lies behind us and what lies in front of us it's nothing compared to what lies within us. You have unlimited potential. The potential that you have is capped not just by the giftings that you have, that's in the natural, but it is capped by the size of the God you believe in. You may be a vastly talented, high resource, educated person, but if you don't have a big God, your potential will always be limited. Because God has no limit. He's boundless. But the God we carry is often too small in our eyes. Therefore, we never dare to venture out and think big for Him. You know, many years ago, I had to struggle with this. You know, when I finished all my, my, my medical studies in the UK, and I was struggling with God because the career path, after specializing and doing my postgraduate, the career path was open to the whole of the whole of the United Kingdom in terms of career paths are open for you, whether academic or otherwise. And I asked to ask God, God, what do you want me to do? I didn't want to go come home. But God says, you go home and I want you to go to Sabah. Sabah is the wild, wild east. I don't even belong to Sabah. I'm a West Malaysian. Go to Sabah, 30 years ago. And so we flew from London Heathrow to Hong Kong. Hong Kong to Singapore. Singapore to KL. KL to Kuching where my, my wife comes from, eventually Kuching to KK. And from KK, we got posted to a small town on the wild, wild east, you know, of, of Sabah, called Sandakan. As you can see, the airports were getting smaller and smaller as we went. <laughs> and that's where we went. We just stepped out. We could have said, but God, but suppose God, but suppose you but suppose it's a career suicide, but suppose. But for 30 years, God has never shortchanged us. It depends on the size of your God. Because that's our capacity. But God has no capacity. It's limitless in terms of His capacity. It's infinite. You know, you put an a, a, a shark in an aquarium, just a great white shark in an aquarium, baby great white shark in an aquarium. The shark will never grow bigger than the size of the aquarium for the rest of its life. But you put the shark into the Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean or whatever, it grows to a huge monster about half or three quarters the size of the stage. Huge. Why? Because it's the expanse of the ocean. There's no limit to it. That's what it grows. So it's the same here. It will cap your potential. 
You see, in the natural realm, there are many people who have overcome handicaps. And already they have overcome this. Naturally, they can overcome handicaps. But you can have the ability not only to overcome your handicaps naturally, but you have a God that's big. You have a big God. You have a God that's without limit. He says to you, speak, but God, don't say, but suppose. You know, I'll tell you some people who have overcome handicaps in their lives. For example, do you know the, the famous film star, you know, Marilyn Monroe? Do you know her? How many of you know her? Can I see your hands? Actually, I don't know her. I know of her only, okay? I, I don't know her. So, I, Marisa, I'd like to get to know you better. Okay. I, I, no, she was a stammerer. She was a stammerer. And look, she became a film star. Do you know Bruce Willis had a stammer? The actor? And he overcame that. So did Benny Hinn, the great healing evangelist. He had a stammer. He overcame that. You know, and, and Moses was arguing with God in, the, in, in Exodus 4. I cannot speak because I've got a stammer. And you know, in medical school, I had a, I had a colleague in my cohort who, who had a stammer. And uh, you know, if you have a stammer and you're trying to do medicine, it's, it can be really hellish. Why? Because part of medical clinical training is that you have to present your patients to the professor and all the specialists and all the junior doctors and all the medical students and, and the whole of the ward and sisters and everything else, you know, uh, week after week on what we call grand ward rounds. And grand ward rounds move very fast. You've got to present your patient. You've got to make the diagnosis. You've got to make the prognosis, uh, you know, and, and discuss the treatment and argue. It. So you've got to have some eloquence. But there's a, a guy in my cohort, bright enough to get into medical school, but he had a, 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 a stammer. Now, please, I'm not make, take, making fun of people who have stammer. God will help you to overcome that, but I just dramatize it so that you, you just see how he overcame it. You know, he had a stammer. So normally, we will present the patient and say, this is Mrs. Smith, she's 47 years old, she came in with chest pains and, uh, and sweating, and, uh, you know, we made the blood pressure so much, and uh, we make the diagnosis that she's got ischemic heart disease. And then the professor will discuss. But ca can you imagine uh, this uh, person with stammer doing that? You know, this is it. Ward round's got to move fast. M -m -m it's it's, it's going to be terrible. But this is how he overcame it. He realized that his stammering or his speech can be improved if he gets into a rhythm in line with his breathing. So in order to get that rhythm, he used to, he used to beat his thigh with his hand in order to get a rhythm. So he would present, he, said, he would say, this is Mr. Smith. She is 47 years old. She came in with chest pain and with sweating. And we made her blood pressure 140 over 80 and the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease. It was awesome just to watch him do that, you know, speaking and all that. None of us were listening to what he said. We were just watching his hand on the thigh going <laughs> like that. He overcame his handicap just by natural means. But you, I tell you, when you have a God that is boundless and infinite, Instead of you saying, but suppose, but what if, but if, but... Instead of saying that, from your heart you say, but God. Something begins to change in your life. How many of you have heard and seen uh, this man called Nick Vojcik? Nick Vojcik. He came here in UMC, right? You know, last year when he was in KL, I brought my daughter to SIB KL to listen to him. He's sitting in the front seat. I told Sarah, my 15-year-old daughter, I said, listen to, to, her, to him, Sarah, listen, so that you will know there's nothing you cannot overcome with God. And Nick Vojcik, he was born with tetramelia. He had no arms, no legs. That was how he was born. And for many years, he questioned what was the reason for why he was in this. Why was he born with arms and legs like everybody else? With, you know, why wasn't he given arms and legs like everybody else? He was complaining to God. And his parents used to say to him, he was Christians, his parents. You know, Nick, you can complain about what you don't have. Or you can thank God for what you have and use it for his glory. He rejected that. He nearly he committed suicide. He tried to commit suicide a couple of times. Until one day he came across a passage in John chapter 9. And in that passage, there was a man born blind. And the disciples said to Jesus, why was this man blind from birth? Is it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? And Jesus said, neither. This man was born blind so that the glory of God may be revealed to many. And that was Rhema to Nick Vojcik. He read that. Why was I born without limbs? That the glory of God may be revealed. And his life changed. From then on, he decided he would no longer complain about what he didn't have but he will use what he had for God's glory. And his life changed. He graduated from college. 
He plays football, he surfs, he skydives, he windsurfs, you know, he golfs, he does everything, almost everything. You know, he never complained about any of these things. And he, he, there was no limit up to when I heard him. He said he had preached to 300 million people in the world. They turn up here and he preaches a strong gospel. I believe that by the time he comes to the end of his life, he would have preached to far more people than Billy Graham ever did in his lifetime. Why well, was a guy without limbs, without arms and without legs? Every, he could have gone on, but suppose I had arms and legs. But what if, if only I had, I'm quite good looking, if only I had an arm or leg, what if? What, suppose, but suppose, he never. He said, but God. And his life changed. And he wrote the books called Limitless, Unstoppable. Then he got married. It's amazing. He danced on his wedding day. How do you dance without arms and legs? He danced. You ever seen that video? He danced. And not only that, he now has a baby. How does he carry his baby without arms and legs? He carries his baby. Go to YouTube and find out how he does it. It's incredible. He could have said, but suppose, but suppose. He said, but God. Somebody say, but God. Oh, that, that's a very weak, but God. You don't even half believe what you're saying. Somebody say, but God. God. Somebody say, but God. God. You know, the devil may try to stop you, pull you down, drag you into oblivion and try to cast you out and try to kill your children, kill your life, kill your marriage, kill your business, kill your finances. But, God. but, God. I want you to understand that. It's not, but suppose, but God. But suppose not only capture potential, it will kill your faith. Fear killed Moses' faith for 40 years. Fear of Pharaoh, fear of Egypt, fear of rejection, fear of death, condemned him from being a reclusive fugitive forever. He was a wanted man in Egypt, went from somebody to a nobody overnight. But what kills your faith today? Today for you. Some of you are struggling your faith. Some of it, it's about to die. Some of it, it's, it's very weak. It's going down that, down that road. Is it a broken relationship? Is it a disappointment? Is it a divorce? Is it a broken dream? Is it a death that was unexpected in your family? Is it your children getting rebellious and going a wall, or they've gone to ad addiction? Is it because you are in debt? Is it because of unfaithfulness in one of your spouse, or your girlfriend, or your boyfriend? Is it unemployment? Is it because you've been cheated or betrayed? Or is it because you have been abused as a child and you cannot trust men again? What is it? Because that always shapes you. Every time God says, I'm going to use you, son. I'm going to use you, my daughter. But, 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 but suppose, God, but... No. But God. But God. But God. Because but suppose will kill our faith. It will cap our potential. It will paralyze us. So much, so much. There are all different kinds of fears now. In fact, there are all, nearly 300 medically categorized fears today. Some of these fears become so pathological, they paralyze people that they cannot perform, they cannot do anything. And so we give them all kinds of names and they need psychiatric, you know, treatment. Uh, all these kinds of fears. Fear of closed spaces, confined spaces, claustrophobia. It's a name. Fear of open spaces, agoraphobia. Fear of heights, acrophobia. Fear of snakes, there's a fear of snakes. It's called herpetophobia. Yeah, fear of spiders, arachnophobia. There's even a fear of money. Some people, they see, they're terrified of money. It's called chromatophobia. Now, anyone got a problem because I can really help you? <laughs> Just put up your hand. Come and see me afterwards. You know, I specialize in people who have fear of money. <laughs> chromatophobia. There's even a fear of going to church. Yeah, it's called ecclesiophobia. You can check it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, I don't have that. <laughs> You're here this morning. There's even the fear of pastors. Yeah. Not your senior pastor. I'm talking about other pastors. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's called hierophobia. There is even a fear of wives. It's called laopophobia. <laughs> so, you know, so all kinds of phobias are in existence. My wife had a fear of height. Nancy, when I married her, I wanted to find out if she, 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 you know, she could climb mountains. I love climbing mountains, outdoor life. So I brought her up to Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in Britain, a, more, a mere 4,000 feet up in North Scotland. And in the first year of marriage, I took her up. Uh, you know, I think she, she was quite game for it. She went up to the top of the mountain, stood on the summit, 
You know, it's, you, as you climb a mountain, you don't know how high you are. You just look at the next step in front of you, right? But when you stand on the summit, you really then realize how high up you are. You see the, the, the sea in the distance, you know, the, the cars, the vehicles, and the little specks, you know, the fields in the distance, and then you realize how high up you are. And that's exactly what happened. When she stood on the summit, she realized how high up she, are, she was, and I didn't know she had a fear of heights. And she says, she, she was frozen. She immediately sat down. I said, what's wrong? We've got to go down. She said, I can't. I didn't know they were so high up. I've got a fear of heights. Alama, if only you had told me before the wedding. No, no, okay. <laughs> I said, you've got to go down, darling. You've got to go down. She said, I can't. So I, she said, so, so how? Because we can't stand up here forever. And she says, no, I can't, I can't. I said, can you slide down? So she said, I think I can slide down. She was on the backside. So she slid down the mountain like that. So she slid down the mountain all the way because she dared not stand up. It took us longer going down the mountain than climbing up the mountain. <laughs> we reached the foot of the mountain at 9 p.m. at night. Do you know? And I, I realized that, my goodness, I've married, uh, you know, a wonderful, beautiful woman who I love very much. She's got a fear of heights. Oh, God, fear of heights. Then when we were posted to Sabah, and that's where the highest mountain in Southeast Asia is, Mount Kinabalu, 13,500 feet, three times the height of Nevis. And when I climb up to Mount Kinabalu, many, many times, I've been up there for, for many, many times, okay, 24 times I've been up Mount Kinabalu. I, I, the first time I went up, I stood on Mount Kinabalu, I said, no way Nancy can come up here. It's so high up, you know, and there's no way. Uh, and she came, when I came down, I said, don't even think about it, it's impossible for you, no way. Then one day, she came to a meeting just like this, and a man of God came by, and he said here, release the word of God. He said, there are people here with the fear of spiders. I said, that's you. <laughs> and people here with the fear also of uh, cockroaches. I said, that's you. <laughs> and she said, also the fear of heights. I said, that's triple you, you know. You got your three numbers right, you know. It, I think he's speaking about She said, I think so too. So she came out for prayers. And the man of God laid hands on her. She fell under the power of the Spirit. Got up. She came back to the seat. I said, what's happened? She said, I think something's happened. I think my fear of heights is gone. I said, really? So I, we tested it. So the next day, I took her up on a hill that was about 800 feet high, overlooking the city. It's quite steep. So she climbed up with me and stook, stood and looked at the city lights. And I said, what's uh, in the evening? I said, how do you feel? She said, okay. I said, can you walk down? I thought she would just sit on her backside again, slide down. <laughs> she said, yeah, sure. She walked down. I said, it's fantastic. I said, can you run down, jog down? She started jogging down. God had delivered her from the fear of heights. Oh, come on. You want to give the Lord a hand? Give him a big hand. And so on our 11th anniversary, we climbed Mount Kinabalu together. Just about a couple of months after that, we climbed Mount Kinabalu together. And there she stood on the summit of Mount Kinabalu. And those of you who have been up, you know, Behind you, when you look at the oceans in front of you, in the huge system, you know, it's so high up. Behind you on the summit is a one-mile drop, 5,000 feet drop, zoom, sheer drop. So if you've got a fear of heights, you go jelly, you know. She stood there. I said, how is it? She said, I don't like it very much, but it's fine. And God had delivered her. Now, if God can do that, uh, about the cockroaches and uh, the spiders, is coming one day, okay? okay? <laughs> one thing at a time. Say, tell your viewer and say one thing at a time. God can do it all, but you know, uh, so, so that's gone. And God has released her from that, and that fear doesn't paralyze her anymore. So I want you to understand that if you say, but suppose, it will firstly paralyze you spiritually, it will cap your potential, it will kill your faith. And for Moses, it paralyzed him and did all of that in his life. But he learned to say, but suppose, but God. From but suppose to but God. Everybody say, but God. You know, when we say, but God, the first thing it does is that there are three things but God will do to your life. If you learn to say it out of your spirit and out of your heart, but God, it will do three things for you. Firstly, we are told it will make us alive together. Somebody say together. How many of you believe this is a church of faith? Can I see your hands? Now, if you come to GUMC, and you continue to worship God, you continue to hear the Word of God, get ministered to by the Spirit, you will grow in your faith, you will grow corporately, you will grow together. Somebody said together. He will make you alive. You may be dying in your faith, but you come. He will make you alive together in Him because the language of faith is but, 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 we are made alive together in Him. Let's read it together. Read it loud. Go. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He made us alive. Somebody say alive. Alive, alive together in Christ. You know, in Jesus' name, that grace, you know, it, He makes us alive. How many of you, you want God to make you alive and more alive than ever in Christ? Can I see your hands? Wave it in the air. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Everybody say, but God. Think of what's facing you in your problem and your challenges in your family or finances or your health right now. Think of it now. That is your mountain. That's what the devil is trying to do in shackling your life. He's trying to get you to say, but suppose, but suppose, but what if, but... But you say, but... Think of that thing again, that mountain one more time. And you say to that mountain, but... The devil is trying to fool you into despair and depression and death, but... The devil is trying to finish your family and your marriage and your finances, but... The devil is trying to do this and that to our nation, to pull our nation into the doldrums and all kinds of extremism and violence, but... But God. You can put your hands down. You see, when you say, but God, it is the language of faith, born out of your spirit, based on God's promises. And you know, faith pleases God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I know you can please God by giving to the poor, by doing evangelism, you know, by walking right with God, but explicitly, there's only one explicit, very explicit in the New Testament. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You say, why God, why is it so important that my faith pleases you? It's very simple. You know, when my son Andrew, I have three children, um, and they're grown up now, but when my son Andrew was uh, four years old, he was playing on the tabletop, Pirates of the Caribbean. ta -da, Pirates of the Caribbean. I walked by and I said, Andrew, jump off the table, Dad will catch you. He said, yeah, Dad, that's, the table's too high, I can't, I can't. I said, son, don't worry, Dad will catch you, trust Dad. No, no, Dad, it's too high, I'll come down the chair, I'll come down. No, no, Andrew, just jump off the table, Dad will catch you, Dad will catch you. No, no, I'll break my leg, Dad, you, you will drop me, I'll fall. No, Andrew, trust Dad, Dad will catch you. No, it's too high, Dad. Look, look at that. Dad will catch you, okay? Trust. Dad, you don't drop me. I, I won't drop you, Andrew. I, I, jump. Dad will catch you. Make sure. I jump. I'll catch you, Andrew. And he jumped. I caught him. When I caught him, he was delirious with joy. Oh, Dad caught me. Dad caught me. Oh, he was so happy. Dad caught me. Oh, he was delirious. But I tell you, his joy was nothing compared to mine. Why is that? My son trusts me. And that is why faith brings pleasure to God. Because you trust Him. You trust Him. But there's no point if 20 years ago you had faith in God, but that faith hasn't grown. You only trust in God to bring you safely to church and to give you a car park. <laughs> Many of us, our God is no bigger than our car park. The only time when we pray in tongues, Shikira Baha, God help, car park. I know, people in KL, that's what you always pray for. I know, turn to your neighbor and say, he's not talking about me, hallelujah. <laughs> That's the size. 20 years later, all you're praying for is car parks. How does it please God? You're not grown. Just imagine the scene. My son now, Andrew is now 24 years old. Supposing he's still playing on the table, Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and, I, and I walk past and I say to Andrew, Andrew, jump off the table. Dad will catch you. Do you see there's something wrong with that scene? But that's what sometimes our life is. We know more Christian songs. We know the jargon. We know the hallelujah, praise the Lord, brother. We know a few scriptures. We've gone to church more often. But we have not grown in faith. We are still on the table going pirates of the Caribbean. We've grown older, but we have not grown in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. How many want to please God? Can I see your hands? Everybody say after me, without faith. It is impossible to please God. Today, in Jesus' name, I'm going to, go, I'm going to grow in faith and trust God's voice. It won't be but suppose, but it will be, it will be, it will be, but God. It will be but God. Whatever your situation says. You know, as a man, exactly the same situation, he was 24 years old. He was working in an office on the sixth floor. And then he realized there was fire coming from the floor below. He was the only one in the office that time. 
And he came from the fifth floor. Smoke was billowing out from the fifth floor. All his exits were blocked by fire. And he opened the window. He stood on the ledge. He could see the fire engines and the people there. And everybody shouted to him, jump, jump, jump. But he did not jump because he couldn't see. He's on the sixth floor. They could see him, but he couldn't see them very well. They said to him, jump. He couldn't jump. He dare not. Then he heard a voice. And the voice said, son, jump. It's okay, son, you can jump. It was his dad. And then he remembered many years ago, he was Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> on a table. And his dad said, jump, son, I'll catch you. Now he's 24 years old on the sixth floor. And he heard, jump, son. My dad, he jumped. And they caught him in a tarpaulin canvas, the fireman, and saved him. You see, you can never jump until you first heard to jump when your dad asked you to jump. It's a small step now. That's why without faith, it is impossible to please God. You must understand that what God calls us to walk this journey. As a disciple, that will be our breakthrough in our life. Can somebody say an amen to that? And that's why we always, we know, you know why God wants you to grow? Because in faith, because you are His beloved. Everybody say after me, I'm God's beloved. No conviction. Everybody say after me, I'm God's beloved. Do you know, there's a, a disciple, there's a, there's a phrase, you know, who was the disciple that Jesus loved? John, right? John, you see that in the New Testament. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you know, that phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved, you know where it's found in the New Testament? It's only found in the Gospel of John. <laughs> Let's tell you something. You know, when Peter wrote it, he never wrote. When Paul wrote, he never wrote that. When Matthew wrote, he didn't write. But John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. Fantastic. You know, it's just like, for example, you know, uh, let's say this evening, you know, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Chris, come and myself, we went out to Starbucks for coffee. And you know, I go back and do my journal. Tonight, tonight, three men of God, three mighty men of God went out and had fellowship at, at Starbucks. There was Pastor Daniel Ho and Pastor Chris Cum, and the pastor whom Jesus loved. <laughs> now you must understand, Jesus loved them just as much as me, right? But I'm practicing His love. You remember? I'm confessing His love. I'm practicing His love. Yeah, can somebody say amen to that? Amen. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are seated beside God's beloved. That's why He wants you to grow in faith. That's why. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. He made us alive together in faith. And then the Bible tells us, He raises up together with Him. He raises up. Let's read Ephesians 2 verse 5. Ready, go, loud. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He makes our faith alive and raises up. Suddenly we find our faith growing. We find we understand God's grace. We find that despite all our own limitations, God raises up. Last week, last month, not last month, last year, I was in Singapore. And many of you know that there is a, you know, for my family, my little girl, Sarah, who is now 15 years old, at the age of four, she was found strangulated on a clothesline, and accidental strangulation in a clothesline at the backyard of our violin teacher's house. Now, do you MC, you know this story, right? Wave your hand if you know this story. Most of you know this story, because I won't repeat it. But God had brought, she was dead when she was brought down at age of four. You know, we could say, but suppose, but suppose, but suppose. But God brought, brought breath, uh, breath back into her life. We could say, but suppose, but suppose, but suppose, that she will have brain damage. But God cleared everything. She's today a vivacious, bubbly, 15-year-old girl, intelligent, full of life, God brought her back to life. And people ask me how Sarah is today. She is 101%. But God, can somebody say amen? But God. And last year, I met somebody who was the same. You know, her name was Suzanne Chin. And she came out in Singapore newspaper as the lawyer, the corporate lawyer who died in Hong Kong and was on life support in Hong Kong for three days, for five days on life support. And on the third day, the doctors told the husband they wanted to turn off her life support because she was brain dead. Apparently, she had a stroke or something, and uh, they, they brought her, or heart attack, something, and she, they brought her to the hospital. This was reported in the Singapore Straits Times. 
It caused a huge Ferrari. But I personally, because I had a similar story in my family, I met her. We sat down and had tea together. She's a Christian. And then somewhere, when they're about to uh, take off a life support, the family came to pray, including her brother was a Christian doctor from Singapore, flew all the way to Hong Kong, prayed for her. She came back to life. You know, on the 50s, she suddenly woke up when all the signs were of brain death. All the doctors had concurred, she had brain death. And brain death people, 100% never wake up one. She woke up. Today, she's serving God in uh, the, the church in Singapore. She is an intercessor. She leads the intercession team. Oh, God has done tremendous thing in her life. She raised, she was raised up. Now, I want to tell you this. Not only physically can God do it, He can raise the dead. Somebody say amen. Uh, somebody say amen. amen. He can do that. How many like to see that in your lifetime? I'd like to see more in my lifetime. He can raise the dead. But He can raise you spiritually today above your circumstances and where you are. Can somebody say amen to that? He raises up together in Christ Jesus. Then, you know, Moses, his hands were just limited hands. All his hands were good for was pat the backside of 300 sheep. He never saw his potential that God could use him to be a visionary and the leader of prophet of 3 million people. His hands are no use just patting backside of sheep and trying to chase away a few wolves. But when he put his hand into God's hand, when he raised his hands, the plague came to Egypt. When he raised his shaft, staff with his hands, the Red Sea parted. So everybody look at your hands. Look at your hands now. Now look at your neighbor's hands as well and say, my hands are better looking than yours. <laughs> everybody look at your hands now and say after me, say these hands. Yes. Say it loud. Say these hands yes. are ordinary hands. But in God's hands, these hands become miraculous hands. With these hands, I will bless people. With these hands, I will bring peace into households and nations. With these hands, I will chase out demons. With these hands, I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. With these hands, I will impart blessing and anointing on people, on friends, on my family. These are God's hands. In Jesus' name. And if you believe that, say aloud, amen. amen. Give each other a high five and say blessed hands. Hallelujah. That's what you will do. He will raise you up. And finally, when He makes you alive, He raises you up. He will make you sit with Him in heavenly places. He make us sit with Him. Can we read it one more time? Ready, go. And raise us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But God, who is rich in mercy, will raise us up to sit with Him together in the heavenly places. Now, where's the heavenly places? Now, the phrase heavenly places is only found in one book in the whole Bible. It is in the book of Ephesians, only there. So if you read the book of Ephesians, you will find out where heavenly places are. In short, the heavenly places is a spiritual realm. It's a spiritual realm, a spiritual posture, a spiritual position of authority which the devil cannot get access to and cannot pull you down. You may have crisis. The crisis may be real. You may have challenges. The challenges may be real. It's not that you bury your head in the sand and no, pretend it's not there. That's denial. No, you see all this. They're trying to pull you down into despair, into death, into death, into darkness, into disease. All times they're trying to pull you down. But you come into a heavenly place. You are aware of them. It's not going to pull you down. It's a posture, it's a position, it's a place of spiritual place of authority. And Jesus tells us this. He not only makes us alive, He raises up to our faith. And He makes us sit in the heavenly places. So that despite what the challenges are in our lives, our family, our society, in our nation, he can, the devil cannot pull us down. And this is so important because the higher you go, the greater the advantage in the spiritual realm. That's why in aerial combat, in dogfight, the plane that's higher up has the advantage. That's why an eagle will always take out a sparrow, not just because it's stronger, but because it's higher. And it will always be on the sparrow's blind side. The sparrow won't even see it coming. It will take it out. And you know, those in aviation history will know of a man called Chuck Yeager. I see Bob is here. He, he, the pilot, you know, uh, you know, MAS pilot. And you know, we are really grateful for all our MAS pilots. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. I tell you, uh, we are really grateful for all our, our MAS pilots. I tell you, I don't know what pressure they're working under right now. You know, 
you know, and you know, when I get into a plane, uh, a lot of people can say, but suppose, but suppose, but suppose. But Bob, you say, but? Yes. Amen, amen. We're learning that. But God, but God. See, Chuck Yeager, you know, he was the first man to break the sound barrier. He was the first man to fly past Mark 1, the speed of sound. And that happened in 1947. But to get to break the speed of sound, you must fly high. If you try to break the speed of sound at 33,000 feet, commercial airline pilot fleet, your plane will disintegrate. You can't take the air resistance. So what he did in 1947, he put his, his Bell test aircraft on top of another big plane that flew to about 30,000 feet. Then he was released from the plane and shot up to about 47,000 feet, where the air resistance is much less. And then he took the plane, throttled up, and went right into the speed. And as he approached the speed of sound, the whole plane started to vibrate and shake and everything. Nobody would know whether the plane could take it. Then he passed the sound barrier, Mark 1, supersonic boom. And Chuck Yeager had date, made history. The point is, the higher you go, you know, the, the point is, in order to go, to go far, in order to fly far and to last long, you don't have to go high. In order to go far in your Christian life and last long, you got to go high. Somebody say go high. You got to go up into the atmosphere. You've got to go high. And Jesus says He sits us together and we reign with Him.